we wrap up with like the RAM memory scheduling last week, right? And I would like to follow this up a little bit because we kind of like don't have enough time last week to cover everything. So today we will keep talking about scheduling, right? A quick 101 from last week. You said that, hey, we have this timing constraint. We have a bunch of incoming requests on all the processor. I mean, look at your CPU right now. You, uh, many of you are using eight threads processor, full core eight threads. For those of you who are using AMD chip, maybe six, uh, six four, 12 threads or even more, right? It basically means that all your programs say, hey, I want to use the memory from every single program that you run, which means that there'll be a bunch of requests that go to the memory and say, hey, I need to be serviced, right? And in a similar fashion as the network packets, if you think about that, right? Or even things like when you have a bunch of threads queuing up for the CPU time, in the module number one, you need scheduling. You need to figure out who gets to use VRAM, right? And the goal is I want to be able to maximize things like row buffer hit. If I have an open row and the request go to that row, yeah, I'll send more requests to that row. I want to parallelize, uh, parallelize DRAM accesses, even have a bunch of DRAM to multiple banks. I want to separate them out to all the banks so they can be serviced all together in parallel because why not, right? And I want to make sure I have a fair share of like, basically allowing application to progress in a fair pattern. Let's say I run 10 applications, none of them will be slowed down. Or at least only a few should be slowed down just a bit to make sure everyone else is really basically a lot faster, right? And lastly, I want to make sure I don't lose data, which means that all the timing has to be satisfied because if I want to read something and I finish the whole thing too early, it means I don't get the data. If I finish something too late, it means that I lose performance. If I write something and I finish things too early, DRAM is not updated with the correct data. So I, I need to make sure my scheduler issue everything properly. If I need to do pre charts activate, then read and write, I need to do in that order. I cannot just say, I've skipped pre charts I cannot do that. If I need to pre chart I need to pre chart and have to wait for that long. All right. So the obvious policy is first come, first serve, right? In a hopefully fair world, seems like an okay policy. You have a queue, right? But everything doesn't build the same way. Your program doesn't behave the same way. If I have a program that has a lot of row buffer hit, maybe I should get a little bit more services out of it, right? Because I have an or a row open already. Why don't I keep them open and service this program? So here comes the basically this is a con like the default scheduling policy. It's called first ready, first come, first serve in some literature. It was kind of like a partially, not really first ready. It basically means that first row hit. First row hit gets the highest priority, then first come, first serve. So we have two tier scheduling. If you go to the same row, you get better priority. Any request to the same row would always have higher priority. If you hit in the row buffer, and there's like five requests, then you first come, first serve. If nothing hit in a row buffer, everything else are first come, first serve as well. So that's that's the second tier. All right. Any question about this policy? This is like the simplest one. You look at every single bank and then you say, hey, is that a row hit? If it's a row hit, I send this guy. All right. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yes. Two different banks, not two different roles, two different banks. It tries to add the as well as possible, spread all the requests to other banks, but within the same bank, I'll try to make sure it's a row hit request. All right, so that's the policy. So what could go wrong? So one thing that can go on wrong, right? This is back in the day, this is like fix our uh quite a while for quite a while but if you always do frcfs and you have that one application that in the row buffer all the time will anyone else get to use DRAM? yeah so you can basically deny or service someone else right by writing an application that go to the same row 
And how many row buffer do I get until I need to switch to another row? My quick question, you get the DRAM access only if you have a cache mix, right? So it has to be a fresh new cache access to go to DRAM. How big is the row buffer? Let's say it's two kilobytes. How big is my cache block? Let's say 64 bytes. So you divide the two number, you're gonna get that. So it's two to the 11 over two to the six. So that's two to the five, right? 32, if my math correct, but also please correct me if I'm wrong. So you get 32 consecutive requests before either, everything is a cache hit because your entire row is in your DRAM are not, not in the cache. Or you go to another row, which means that every time I have my row open, I get this, I can deny everyone else service until I finish this 32 memory request. Right? I, I can do that all my, to all my banks, which can slow down application by quite a lot. There are previous literature that show that you can slow things down by like five to seven times, right? Which is quite a bad thing to do. All right. So how do we fix this? Anyone? Have a quick solution for this? Hmm? Yeah, you can do that. So that's one idea. We limit the number of times to go to the same row, right? So you can do some counter based scheme, for example, right? Um, I can set a threshold and say if I have a request that wait for this many cycles already, I get the most priority. We call this FRCFS with a cap. A cap basically means that if I wait for this long, I get higher priority. I don't, it doesn't matter if it's hit or not, I get to use DRAM. All right. Uh, so this is basically modern processor memory schedule. Something, some, some variant of this. All right. Uh, there are more works into this area. Uh, some of them kind of involve like how to make it fair across different applications. But in terms of throughput, in terms of performance, this is basically kind of like a default scheme that you need to know. Uh, I would definitely say that if people ask you a question about this, this is basically in terms of interview question for undergrad and master students, you just need to know this, that, hey, we, we do scheduling in this level. And then be basically realize that there's a fairness issue that still exists and can be fixed. There can be more complex policy, but here's, here's what works. All right, and it's simple. Simple is good. In engineering, keep it this way. Simple is a good thing. Simplicity is best because you don't want to pay a lot of money to fix something. All right, if it can be fixed with 10 baht, Rather than 1,000 baht, I would rather pay 10 baht. You should be a cheap for. Well, hopefully, you don't end up with a solution that they kill someone. All right. So make sure it's an optimal solution, and then you lower the cost, the overall cost. All right. Here are some examples. So let's go through this. I let's say I came up with these are the series of memory requests from top to bottom. Top is the first request that arrived, but let's say it arrived at every other cycle. So you see the first, then the second, then the third, then the fourth, and the fifth, right? And assume you have 16 banks with the bank bits, because if 16 banks, you can basically have lock two of 16 for the bits that would be mapped. So these bits in the address will be to bank one, bank two, and bank three, for example. And I say, hey. The 16 to the 19 bit are the bank bits. Whatever number is there, go to that bank number. All right. Then, for the sake of our example, because I want to highlight this thing so that it's easier to see, let's assume a row is 64 kilobytes, which is way too big. All right. This is way too big, but let's assume for the purpose of our example, it's 64 kilobytes per row. And you have only one channel again. I didn't even specify the channel bit. Let's assume everything here go to one channel. Oh, it's one channel, sorry. It's everything goes to one that one channel. All right. Then you have a single level cache with 256 byte block. Again, a little bit on the bigger side. Usually you see like 32, 64, or 128. 256, I mean, possible, right? It's not too bad. 
with 256 sets. All right, so that's our example. Quick question, which one of these are the bytes block with? All right, let me color things. What color is the byte in block with? Your yellow one, yes. Why is that the case? So that's lock to a cache block size. And that tell you for your address, what byte are you accessing, all right? On the caching level, the next set of bits are the set bits. You have 256 sets. So how many bits do you need for that? Lock two of 256 is eight. Aside, right next to the byte in block bit, those are the set bits. So the green is the set ID. And I said bit 16 to bit 19, which is the blue color, is the bank ID. All right, and here's the row ID. I said anything that go after the bank ID is a row ID. Okay. First question, these kind of in the live cache block, right? Because if you have consecutive cache accesses and it's the cache mix, right? One thing you can do is, well, to be honest, one thing you can even do is, if it's a different set, it can go to different banks. Why is that a hit? I can put the bank ID closer so that it actually overlap with the set ID bits. Doesn't matter. That basically means that if I have consecutive cache block blocks to different sets, and if a miss, if, if they are a cache miss, they go to different banks. Why is the benefit of that? Faster, right? I send two requests to two banks is faster than two requests to the same bank. If my program go to all the addresses, right, moving the bank bits to, to toward the right side, toward the lower bits, goes, will allow two hash block misses to be serviced in different banks. Because imagine you are in a loop. You do A of I equals something, and you loop over the index I, right? So when you do A0, A1, A2, A3, A4, your miss pattern will be you start from the original block, then you move to the next, next block, then you move to the next, next block. Then once you're done with this set, you go to the next set. Basically, now, if you put a bank ID that overlap with the set bits, when you have this pattern in a loop like this, you basically would stripe over the, all these set access to all the banks. Right? So you, you can utilize parallel access to the DRAM. Okay, so my point is the bank ID doesn't have to be separate from the set ID bit. I can put it closer. I can put it such that they overlap. So that way, when I have a cache mix, I can put it right after the I mean, if I want to, right after the byte in block bit, that would be kind of useless because my row is two kilobytes, right? If that's the case, I'll get some row bit already for a consecutive cache set, all right? Now, what's the bank am I trying to access for the first request? What's the number for the blue, blue bit? Oh. Bank one, right? This is bank one, bank one, bank one, bank three, bank one, bank one, bank three. Okay. This is row zero, this is row 100, row zero, row zero, row 100, row 100, row zero, row 100. Any questions so far? All right. So if I see this, what are the two first requests that are being serviced? Let's say I have this request A, B, C, D, E, L, G, and H. A will go to bank one row zero. 
What bank is available to give to service this? Bank three. So I'll send A and I send E to bank three. All right. So let me have another blank slide so that I can draw things. All right. So I'll upload over these other requests. One, 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 one. Yes, yes, FR CFS. So those are the pair, bank and row. All right, so if I want to draw something like a timeline, because I have bank one here, bank three right here is the request A, B, C, E, E, L, G, and H, right? So at the beginning of time, I can start with A to bank one, right? I don't know why my finger keep like switching page. I'm sorry about that. And then I do bank E, uh, bank three, I start with request E. Is the row open or closed in the beginning? Oh, nothing in the row buffer, right? So what do I have to do? Activate and read, right? So I activate A, then read A. I activate E, then read E. In the actual question, I might say the activate is this many nanosecond, read this is this many nanosecond. That, that would help me when I'm grading so we can, well, at the end of the day, reach a final number, all right? Now, when I'm finished activating A in bank one, what happened? What gets service next? Should I service B or C? C, right? Why? The row is open. Row, row with the row ID zero is open. So B will take more time or service C. Read C. Read D, right? Then for bank one, what else are going to row zero? E, right? Now, the only case that G as service way later can be, for example, G doesn't arrive until there's nothing in bank one. If G arrives say 100 cycles later, and then we are all done with A, C, and D, bank one is not servicing anything. The next thing it does is that is service B. Now, when I have to service B, what happens? I have to pre-charge, right? Then I activate row 100 so that I can read B. Then I can read L, right? Then that's it, I'm done. Now, for bank three, I have E open to row 100. The only request that go to bank Three is edge, right? To what row? 100, so I can read L, uh, read edge. That's it, I'm done. Any question on this example? Yes, bank one and three are basically totally parallel. The, the, yes. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, for the purpose of taking the exam, yeah, unless I specify that you need to also think about who gets to use the command back at that cycle. It complicates things a little bit. For example, in the beginning, I want to activate A and activate E. I have one command, but what do I do? I need to pick, pick one to send. I'll first say activate A, then activate E in the next cycle. So the first A, the request for A gets start first, E starts right after, in one cycle afterwards. Does that take into, like, does it increase the time by a lot? Not really, because inside the bank, once you activate, it will take like something like 40 cycle to finish the activate command. So that doesn't really matter, but in, in, the, in the more practical sense, you only have one, one command, but 
So each of these command has to take turn who gets to use the command bus, right? But uh, in a more practical sense, this is done in Pro. It's basically designed so that you can issue all these things in Pro. Those are the great, uh, those are great questions. All right. Um, yeah. Yes. Did I miss E? No, E actually gets service in parallel. It doesn't matter. E is like bank three, because bank one and bank three, think of it as two separate things. It's actually there are two separate things, right? I say here, I first issue activate to A, and then next I could activate to E, and then I wait. The command bus basically wait until the activate is done. When the activate is done, activate A to A will, will finish first, obviously. I do read to A in this at the same time, right next cycle, read to E. Both read also will take some time to finish. Now when the data is out, I stream the data out for A. Next cycle, E should be done. I stream data out for E. So A and E, in a more practical sense, they are being serviced in parallel. E, yeah. After, like, let's say you have eight banks, you, you can do this on all the eight banks. What will dictate how many parallel servers you can do? Your address mapping. So if you write a program that always go to one bank, yes, unlucky you, right? So that's one, one more thing the programmer has some control over, which is, can I make sure my program goes to all the banks? Another, well, another design thing that's happening in a really low hardware, hardware low level thing is, can we some also try to like distribute things to multiple things? So there are proposals say, hey, can we cache like multiple bits together? So you put some randomization function to your like your address, so that you get some address, it tries to distribute them across everywhere. Or we play with the address mapping, make sure that if you look at the pattern of how people program. You try to send them out to all the banks. All right. So what is the idea of that? You need to take one side. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's time scale. It, it's done in parallel. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So that's the that's the Yes. Great question. Well, let's say the order is different. B comes first. So I open row for B, then I'll issue F because F is to row 100, the same row as B. Then I pre charge activate row zero so that I can serve with A, C, D, and G. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Uh, you see how you can now issue a lot of requests and why memory bandwidth is more important now because you can serve everything in parallel. This is basically what the GPU exploits quite a lot. GPU actually use, if you measure the application that get run on the GPU, they'll use all the bank a lot of time because that's the nature of the, speed, the, the application being run on a graphic processing unit. You issue a lot of data requests at the same time, they go to off the bank, and it just happened that they will have really, really, really high row buffer hit rate as well. Um, uh, we actually did a real evaluation with like a mem address that we got from real games. And we also saw the same pattern that it exploit all these banks and all the row buffer hits. Um, all right, CPU application is not so much of the case because CPU has a lot of cache. So a lot of these requests will hit in the cache and it doesn't even go to CRAM. So you, what you see from the CPU application is a little bit less memory intensive, if you will. All right, uh, one last thing I want to mention, like I said, memory is a slow thing, right? And we can do, Get a link to prioritize the important request, for example, the row hit request or the orders request. In reality, right, the row hit request, for example, it doesn't have to be the critical request. Remember the uh, pipelining lecture? 
there can be some instruction that generate the result that will block everyone else because everyone depends on that guy, right? If I can make this guy faster by a little bit, means that I can unlock a lot of new application to be scheduled, right? So that becomes that particular request, that particular data access is much more critical to perform. It doesn't mean to be a raw hit. It's just something that has a lot of dependency in the pipeline or in the instruction stream that you see on your code, basically, right? Uh, this is basically something that you have to consider when you design this hardware level thing. How can you, how can you basically tell the information and say, hey, that this, this, this data access is way more important than this data access, even though this one is younger, right? Uh, what requests will stall the pipeline? What requests have more dependency and what requests are more important? These are important things that you need to consider. All right. Uh, I can say that this is quite a, a important topic about 10 years ago. Now, it, you, you're not going to see a lot of work on this area. It kind of narrow down to like things like FRC or that cap with some variation to deal with different applications. And that should be good enough. Right. So, so uh, these are design things, design issues that you can consider for fun. All right, the next thing I want to talk about before we kind of wrap up the semester is VRAM refresh. We talked about it last week. Right? I kind of mentioned that charge loose, like it leaks out over time from your capacitor, right? Basically, within your DRAM, you have to always overwrite this a lot, right? And your question kind of triggered me to do a little bit more detail, right? One more slide, uh, one or two more slides on this. The question was then, does it mean that when I, whenever I do a refresh command, which basically means that I have to write the, the old data back to the same thing, wouldn't that block entry to DRAM? The answer is yes, while I'm refresh. While your DRAM is doing a refresh, no one can access the bank. All right? So that's the issue because uh, with the charge leakage, I had to spend time to rewrite the same data back to the same cell, right? And during this DRAM become busy, it basically means I cannot service any memory. So if you have a 16 gigabyte DRAM, it's gonna be basically, I cannot use DRAM for like a few milliseconds. Is it a bad thing? Do you ever feel that? Why? Uh, first thing first, this will get worse and worse as your DRAM size grow, right? But the thing is, first of all, you don't have to refresh every single row at the same time. All right. So one of the idea that we do is we call smart refresh. Smart refresh is I would do this in a small burst. I space out the refresh to well, to still ensure that everything is refreshed at the sixty-four millisecond in uh, millisecond interval. But I only do a few row at the same time, not all at once. I'll just do this row, this row, this row, and then I stop. And then I let someone use DRAM, and then I keep doing the same thing. Uh, the benefit is it doesn't halt your program. Everything is much smaller. You have to do it way more often. That's okay, because it's kind of mixed up with the other DRAM requests. And you don't have this... Uh, Remember the Conway effects, where you have a big operation and then a bunch of small operations after the big operation. Everyone has to wait for the big operation. That's DRAM refresh. So what we do, slice the Conway into multiple smaller chunks. So now you don't have Conway effects. Uh, this is done in auto refresh uh, in your, your ship. Basically now it's deployed with auto. And that is a typo. That's auto refresh. There's also a smart refresh where you can detect that I just read that row and then I close it. The pre charge operation allow you to fill the, the capacity all the way up. I don't need to refresh. You can also like basically see are there blocks that I don't have to refresh anymore when you just read or write to that entire block. Right. Uh, all right, we're done with the semester. Yeah. Is it too abrupt? Sorry. I was like, 
I feel like I'm, I'm ramping things up, and like you're done. Yeah. All right, so uh, so that's a wrap for a semester. All right, uh, I still have some time. You also, if you download the slide, you see more coming because anything I talk about from now onward, not gonna be on your exam. All right. First thing, how many people want to count this malloc work? Yeah, let's learn how malloc work. Because we're learning system, and it, it, I think it's good to know how malloc work, all right? So what happens when you call malloc? What is malloc? Find a space. Magically, it's like you walk around, you find free land, right? It's a pretty magical function. How do we do this? Okay, look at the memory. So let's, let's go with the, let's, let's go with some idea, all right? We need to figure out what, where in DRAM is free and where in DRAM is not free. So one thing you can do, exhaustive search, who didn't love brute force, the old brute force way to do things. Um, if I have to check every single place in DRAM, are you free, are you free, are you free, are you free, are you free? It's like doing way worse than refresh, to be honest, right? Don't do that. So how do we, how do we make this cheaper? So how do how do we sell uh, land in in real life? Do we for every single uh, square meter do we say that square meter is free or do we become in bulk or right? zoning? Zoning, yeah, zoning. Huh? Yeah. You have some table, right? So you put one idea is well, let's say that's a lot of land. You like slice them up. Into this is a big, big plot of land. It's a smaller plot of land, and you prepare a bunch of these plots in case that your user, the program, say, "Hey, I need a land that fit four kilobytes of data." Another user comes in, "I need a land that only fits sixty-four bytes. That's all I need." Right? So here's my primitive idea. I have a land, and I divide them equally. And let's say one box is four kilobytes, right? And I'm a program, I say, I want to malloc for four kilobytes. Perfect, you get one block. And I'll mark the white region, this box is free. And the black one is taken, right? Not free. So I have another program comes in and say, hey, I want another 4K of land. All right, you're given this block. Is it simple? Now let's say the third application comes in and wants four bytes of land. What do you do? Oh, I don't have any way to track four bytes, so you get four kilobytes. Yay. That's okay, that's our primitive approach. Right? It works. The issue is you're gonna have a lot of internal fragmentation. In this case, this block here, I only need four K, I only need this part. I only need this part. I don't need the rest of it. So you're wasting 900, <laughs> uh, you only have to use four bytes out of four kilobytes, that's only 0.1%, right? The other 99.9% .9 of your DRAM is lost forever with that one malloc call, right? So how do I fix this? Think simple, right? Give me some simple solution. Yeah, you, you use some way to, to manage, right? Some, for example, use a table or something to manage. I have a LAN again, right? Now I would divide to a few of them will be four kilobytes. Some of them will be smaller, two kilobytes. Some of them will be even smaller, maybe like one kilobyte. And then I'll just, this is like the smallest, right? And if I need to use say one kilobyte, I'll just say you get this part that becomes occupied. If I need two kilobytes, I get this. If I need five hundred twelve kilobytes, you get two blocks of this. All right. And so this seems to work. Now, any questions so far about this policy? How do we keep track of this? The OS, like, like, well, whoever is responsible for malloc has to keep track of this. 
So what is the data structure that we learned so far? Give me some so I can pick a few choices. Table, what else? I can use a table, right? For example, let me use a table. I say, hey, this table will store what? I can say, hey, I have the table for four kilobytes and a pointer, right? And it's got it's gonna be a pair of three and occupy, right? Three slash occupy. If I assign this block already, the pointer basically points to this location. So that's a four kilobyte table. And then in another row is two kilobyte. Again, another pointer, right? Because why not? I have a pointer. I can point to the beginning of that land. And then it's a, I have another information that is it free or taken. Okay, now here, table works for our, our need, right? Should be fine. Any potential question or problems that will arise from table? Yeah, what if you, for example, uh, need to make a lot of two kilobyte block and then you only have the need for two of the four kilobytes, right? It basically means that my four kilobyte row will be like two entries. The other one will be like 70 entries, which is not exactly efficient, right? So we can break the idea down. So conceptually, this looks like a table of a free and occupied land. Think of it as a land, all right? Now, to make a better use of that, why don't you do this? Why don't you keep an array? So instead of a table, you say, I have an array of pointers. This will be the pointer that point to a list, a list of three blocks of data. The first row, for example, will be responsible for four kilobyte tracking. The second row will be two for the two kilobytes. This will be for the one kilobytes, right? And we call this a free list. Any information on a free list points to these blocks are free and you have all the sizes you can pick. Let's say I have a mala for 64 bytes. I would just look, okay, who fits my bill? What's the closest to 64 bytes I take from that list? Then I have the same array. All right, and let's say I call malloc. Let's say I call malloc. The simplest thing I can do, I have a tail pointer that points to the end of my list. I say, hey, I got this block because I need four kilobytes, right? It's no longer free, so that the sim simpler way to manage this, if I occupy that land, I move them to the occupy list. So this is the occupy list. We just implement our malloc. This is the simplest form of malloc. Yes. Uh, how do we keep three space? So that's the question, right? Well, originally when you boot up the computer, it has all the free space. So originally there'll be a bunch of free lists. Then whenever you call malloc, right, you just move from the free list to occupy list. That's it. Uh, for the system, yes, for the OS. Okay. I mean, what I mean is technically you can write your, like you can write a program to perform your own version of Malloc. You go like low level and say, hey, I want to rewrite how I manage the list. I want my own way to manage the list because I know about my application. I don't need that long list. I just need me like one, one list of two megabytes. And then a bunch of other smaller lists because I know my application is either use a huge amount of data or like 10 bytes. Right? I can do that. Uh, another thing is when you use a list, you have to walk the list. So it's not always cheap. So you can kind of like use a different data structure to maintain this. The third thing is that what would be the policy? So let's say I want two kilobytes and the two kilobyte list is no not free. It's gone. 
What do I do? So one thing I can do, I can slice up the four kilobytes into two blocks of two kilobytes, right? So the post of your monologue in the case of the, the list of your size, your desired size is gone. You can go up the size, slice them together. Now put the two boxes on the smaller size. Now, when you have a lot of say two kilobytes, because you've been slicing up the four kilobytes, then you can, that's another big overhead. You can then figure out which one of these two kilobytes I can combine to make the four kilobytes again. It's a bunch of list operations as well, so you can optimize on how do we make it more efficient. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I can. I can also do that. But figuring out which of the one kilobytes to combine take more time, so it's always easier to go the bigger size and slice them because that's instant, right? So that that's how when you call malloc, it should be as fast as possible. And then even though one call malloc a lot for a while, I can like spawn another thread to like combine this thing together in the background. Uh, and then hopefully I lock <laughs> I lock the structure right away. So if I if I have to do manage the structure, lock them basically means that if I don't call malloc, if I know I'm not gonna call malloc, I can lock the structure and manage them, and then unlock it so that people who want to call malloc now can do it after grid. All right, so that's malloc. Uh, let's do a quick break before we go through like. New technology that you actually start seeing now in a in a high end GPU. All right, so uh, I'll I'll pause the recording uh, and then we'll resume in ten minutes. With uh, let's continue with more memory technology. Uh, again, now sit back, relax. Nothing will be on exam. All right, just listen and chat with me if you want to. Uh, basically, advanced memory technology. The first thing is. Uh, there are actually a lot of emerging memory technology to replace, not to replace per se, but to upgrade DRAM in some case to be a, a hybrid solution where you have DRAM and the last bullet point non volatile memory. Uh, how many people use SSD? SSD is, a, is actually a, a, a type of non volatile storage. The reason why we call this non volatile it basically means that you don't have to refresh. Your data is, is there. It doesn't have to be refreshed. It's not gone. You have something there. You wait two more years. You open the file. It should still be there. That's your SSD, right? So that new technology that uh, is a lot more costly compared to SSD, but it's a lot more cheap. It's a lot cheaper than DRAM. It basically also means uh, uh, has a mean to like make it bigger, so you can get like a one terabyte memory or two terabyte memory rather than what you have right now, which is like maybe one hundred twenty eight gigabytes or something. All right, so that's a non volatile memory, and there are multiple types right now that are competing. There's no clear winner yet. Uh, that's a, a few companies are kind of like invest in different technology right now. So uh, it'd be interesting to see when it does settle and where things are. Um, the part that has does settle already is that the, the tile and stack D routes. All right. So these are stacking technology. I, I mentioned this for, I think, a few times already. Basically, it means that. I have a ship. Remember the, the image of the DRAM dim by the green board and then the ship that are next to each other, right? The stack DRAM means I put them on top of each other. What would be the classical problem with that? It heats up, <laughs> right? It heats up. So back in the day, there's quite a lot of problem with like how to build this. Um, the, the solution from the material science and from the organization set of things is kind of being solved now. So your GPU, for example, can come with this technology. Uh, basically, what you have is you have chip stack on top of each other, and you have also the possibility of putting logic gates 
at the bottom layer. When I said logic is think ALU, think really, really simplify CPU in there. All right. So the benefit, as I said, is not pin limited anymore. You can have two silicon here that pierce through all the chip and give you a lot more bandwidth. Imagine a DRAM with like hundreds of bank and tens of channel. <laughs> That's what you get from a stack memory. That's why this type of memory is actually called, uh, in many cases, uh, some, some manufacturer called high bandwidth memory or HBM technology. Basically, when you see HBM technology, think stacking. The way it's organized, it's a little bit different from DRAM. The trade-off is you get way more bandwidth. Some cases it might be a little bit slower than typical DRAM. Some cases are competitive in terms of the speed. Some cases I've seen papers that use the even faster speed, right? Depending on the how you manufacture it. Yes. Go through, yeah, it go through. It calls it through silicon gear. Uh, so basically think of this as like your ship, right? And you're gonna have like wire that uh, that connect like this. So instead of 1D surface through your motherboard, you have a 2D surface to connect to all the two silicon gears to enable like all the banks on each layer. So now you don't have just one layer or one bank of the ship. You have multiple layers that can go through the ship. So you get way more bandwidth. Oh, Oh, that that costs too much. I would I would imagine that would cost too much to like have a cooling unit through your ship because it means that you're gonna sacrifice the middle area of the ship, which might have wiring as well, not just that particular area for storage. It might be wiring for other things. Okay. So it may be hard to like lay them out. Lay them out. Um. So here's a more. Uh, cartoon example of this, uh, you have a CPU and the green thing is basically logic where you can have the uh, things like accelerators, some basic logic to do things. What's the benefit? It's like you have mini computer here, right? That can uh, basically use your data here right now that you don't have to go through the bus between the memory and the CPU. The data is much closer to this logic, all right? So if you have a program that access the data back and forth and back and forth and back and forth a lot, there might be benefit in terms of energy efficiency because you don't have to transfer the data all the way from DRAM to here and all the way back to here. It's just through this logic layer and you're done. You also get a lot more bandwidth in that case, right? Um, uh, basically, you also can get higher capacity as well. Uh, there are earlier generation of AMD GPU use tiling. It's not full blown stacking on top of each other, but you put the chip right next to each other and you tile them so that you take advantage of basically the bottom layer, which is the what we call the interposer. Now, the, the next generation becomes like, I can stack now. Yeah, I can deal with the heat and everything. So you stack them on top of each other. That you, that's what you can see in the modern day server grade GPU in the top end. Um, you get a lot of internal bandwidth because you have those wiring, the metal that go through, right? Uh, a lot of external bandwidth because your surface is now the, the, the connection. You don't have to rely on 1D, it's now the whole surface. And you can, there are actually proposals that say, hey, why don't we put this on the same die as the processor? So why not? So the thing also research work is going to, can we do that? Can we package them on the same die? If that's the case, then can we make their access as fast as the cache access? All right. Uh, well, the question here is how, right? Obviously, clear benefit. Uh, also, possible to have compute element. Within the package, we call this the uh, processing in memory. So there's been a lot of work already to say, hey, we can do this small logic that do this task and it'll be a lot faster than just running on a, running this on a CPU.
so what can we do with logic, right? Basically, think of a simple ALU. For example, uh, I, I did kind of work with my, one of my uh, groupmates uh, back in 2018 that we uh, look at uh, Google, what is it, the Chromebook workload that are related to a few things that user would have used, right? And see, are there potential performance, energy, benefits in using this program, uh, uh, PIM, processing in memory, put some of this workload on this uh, die, rather than have compute that on the CPU, do we get benefit of that? Uh, so we actually identified that quite a lot of benefit in certain parts of your workload, not all. You have to be smart of what, what are you going to schedule there. You don't want to run everything now because that's a really wimpy CPU. Right? So you want to be selective of what you want to do there in order to most of the time pre-process your data so that the CPU can handle the rest of the compute. Uh, there's also computation as well, because your data is now next to DRAM, it means that you have a CPU right next to them that's right to DRAM. Now your CPU have your own cache. How can you make sure that that cache is updated? Whenever I write to DRAM, I need to update my cache, right? Because they share the data. So that's also been worked in, in that area. So there's quite a lot of work right now from year 2018 to 2017 to now on this topic, on what we can do. It's sad to saturate now, so you see more workload kind of converging into these are the potential benefits. This doesn't make sense anymore. I My prediction, my internal prediction would be in the next 10 years, we might see some startup on this area that come from the research. Uh, uh, angle. Uh, also, that's non uh, non volatile memory. This is, I would say, earlier than processing in memory. It's been out since like 2007 in terms of architecture work. Way earlier than that in terms of the circuit and the material science work. Uh, we can look into are there any possible technologies that doesn't require refresh, right? Or something that's denser than DRAM. Uh, there was this thing called Intel Optane uh, memory. I think I stopped selling it right now because it doesn't really like make sense in terms of the the business point of view. There's not a lot of people who would be able to program this thing, but you can actually buy those things and it actually has this non local memory attached that you can run and work like run a program on. Uh, you get much more capacity. You don't have to refresh, but it's a little bit slower. Way faster than your SSD. So the way it works conceptually is kind of like SSD, where you store things there and stay there forever, right? So there's been proposals saying, hey, how to use this thing, how to architect this thing. Because for example, if you use SSD, you might have noticed that write to an SSD is destructive. If you write to your SSD too many times, that thing dies. Because the way you write that is you shock the cell. If you shock something too many times, it actually dies, right? So write is destructive to non-volatile storage. Same thing goes with non-volatile memory. So there's a lot of work into, if you want to use it as a memory, write is going to happen way more often than how often you write file. Because every time you write a program, you write something to the memory, right? So how do we make it possible? So there's a bunch of ideas, this, like basically, for example, distribute all the writes everywhere. Uh, anyone buy an SSD and saw that the 512 gigabyte SSD turned into 480? Anyone wondering why is that the case? Or, or something less? Why? They have about 10% of your SSD as a spare cell in case something dies. That's actually a shift on your SSD to manage the data mapping. And if it detects there's so many writes into that block, it disables the block, switch to another new block, write it there instead from the same file. So the SSD internally has to handle that. So how do we do it for the memory? All right. So my opinion on this, again, you might see this technology probably in the next like five to 10 years. I would say maybe a little bit earlier than him processing in memory, in, in my opinion. Um, you might come into a day and age where your multiprocessor, your CPU doesn't look the same way anymore, and your memory doesn't look the same way soon enough when you graduate in the middle of like your uh, uh, engineering career. 
interesting. You might see some changes in the hardware that are pretty radical compared to the last 10 years. All right. Uh, again, benefit is a lot of capacity. You can store a lot more things. Data is persistent. You don't have to refresh, which also means that if the power goes down, what happens? The, you don't lose data, all right? Risk and opportunity into, can I use that somehow? Or problem, if the power goes down, I don't lose the data. How do I make sure that someone doesn't really read that data randomly? How do I protect that data that's just now accessible because of power outage, right? So that, that's another angle on this problem. Uh, no leakage power, so again, you don't lose charge. It's more power efficient. Uh, most of the time, we can also think of it as, why don't we use DRAM as a cache for this thing? Because these are slower than DRAM, right? So now DRAM becomes the last little cache, and then you have the NVM being the much bigger storage before your SSD, right? Um, so that's another way to think about this. For example, the Intel Night Landing has this uh, particular uh, design architecture. Last thing before I wrap it up, I want to talk about the processor to, to, to loop the whole thing around to the module number one. Module number one, we assume multiprocessor. Now, so far, we never talk about the second CPU, right? We only talk about the first CPU. So how do we build this? We stamp it out. We have to design for one CPU. We stamp the same CPU and connect them. That's it. All right. Make use of the engineering seats where we can stamp things out and make copies. Right. Control C is really beneficial as long as there's no bug uh, from it. So we can make the processor faster in 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 uh, in the overall performance point of view by using two CPUs rather than one. Right. Um, but to make the processor faster, like basically, let's say you have a single core CPU and to make them faster, they are not really power efficient. Your CPU is going to be, get really big, really quickly. So one easier way to use your area that you can stamp this thing out is you use smaller CPU, but a lot more growth. Then force your application developers to write about their credit program to use all these CPUs. Yeah, I mean, why not? Just push our work to someone else. Awesome, right? So we can add more processing core, and the core share some resource. For example, we can have a full core CPU these days with a private. Each core has its own M1. Then they share the L2, right? Then they also share the memory. So to utilize them, go back to module one. You map the thread to all of this CPU core, right? Simple. We can also run multiple programs. If you one run program one, if you two run program two, each one of them run into different processes, even simpler, right? We call this multi multi program. And when you run each program on each of the CPU, they don't share. They don't have in, uh, really no shared data, right? So simplify that part as well. The second idea is you have multi threading. This is when you want to make make the program faster. You multi thread them, right? Now, here's a low level issue that we never talk about. I, I told you L1 is chair. L2, oh, no, no, L1 is not chair, but L2 is chair. Memory is chair. Now you have two people that want to use a shared resource. What happens? They can kill each other. All right? How to prevent an application to take all the resources, right? See, when you have 10, well, let's say 30 Chrome tabs you see Chrome start to take all the resource, right? How do you prevent and make sure something else can run? Right? The third one I'll, I'll, I'll kind of briefly mention about this, but we'll go into more detail in the architecture class. We call this data coherency. So let's first not talk about the last two bullets, but these are also ongoing issues as well. Data consistency is, think about it this way. Let's say you are looking at like a, a like the Instagram or Facebook, right? And I I change my profile picture. The sequence of the change may form basis for example. Let's say I have an image of myself, then I change to a picture of my cat, then back to myself, 
the next like basically three image myself my cat and myself right you from the audience point of view you should see the same sequence me cat me not me me cat or cat me me right that's consistency from the point of view from everyone who looked at the data you should see the same sequence data load 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 store store load 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 everyone should see that sequence that is data consistency when you have multi-core processor everyone tries to do their own work so that there might be a consistency issue where one of the core issue this series of load and store you want to make sure everyone else see the same sequence all right and the last bullet point we talked about this in module one already scheduling on the system side of things so i'll skip the last two bullets all right the first two is how to share resource, right? Because everything share the share cache and the share memory. Uh, but some applications demand more of this DRAM. Some of them demand less of them. Some of them want more cache. Some of them doesn't want as many cache. So the problem is this is going to make your memory access even longer. All right. Um, so you want to be able to manage the resources. I'll skip over uh, this slide a little bit. But now you got my point already before I wrap up the class. Uh, you can do things like partition DRAM. Say this application use channel one, this application use channel two, it is possible if you want to do so. You can also scheduling. This application get more priority right now. This application get more priority in the next time phase, right? Uh, you can also do some like system level page management or where memory is gonna be mapped for each application um and for the these uh third issue so i'm gonna go back to this right data coherency because i think it's quite interesting from your point of view so let's say i have processor one processor two l1 cache private cache right l1 cache both of them are private and you have a share l2 And both of them run multi-thread application. All right, they share data. So let's say I share uh, variable A, right? A is share. This guy say, I want to read A. What happened? A is here, right? And A is gonna be here somewhere in the cache as well. The next thing I want to write to A, is that a cache hit? It's a write to A, I get A prime. Do I update L2? Why? I mean, it's a cache hit. I don't have to update it. Right? I can leave it like that. Then P2 comes in. Hey, I want to read A. You got this guy, <laughs> the old guy, right? So coherency is a protocol to dictate if this is the case, P2 would basically retrieve A prime from P1 to make sure that this is now A prime and what you see is over here is going to be A prime as well. So that's the whole idea. You want to make sure it's coherent. Everyone see the same copy of the data when they're being shared and the data is distributed everywhere in this island of shared resources. All right. Uh, that's it for basically for the class. Yeah, we, we wrap it up. Uh, that's all. Uh, on Thursday, we'll, well, I'll post the sample exam and we can come back to that on Thursday. Uh, we we'll do a review. Uh, if you want to work on lab or the project, let me know. Uh, I didn't promise I'll go over the project, did I? Since we're pushing the project by two days, can we do it on Thursday? Project three, overview. If you have, still have questions. How about this? How many people read the handout already? All right. Your homework, Thursday, go read the handout. You're going to have a lot of questions come with questions on Thursday, because I guarantee you, you're gonna have enough time. All right? Have... Huh? Oh, demo there, that's a great question. So I'll, 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 I'll post the link on Discord and Canva. Here's a sign up sheet, pick your time, and I'll, I'll be there in Discord. And you share the screen, I'll ask questions, and then I'll, I'll need to double check with the TA on their time slot as well, so there can, there can be more slots than, hopefully, way more slots for you guys. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 